Well, all right. Crystal Renault Day, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you, Jonathan? Yeah, thank you for, I know we had to reschedule this because uh, you, you weren't exactly feeling 100% last time we tried to get this done, but yep. it's good to see your face and that you are upright. Yes, you too. So, <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know I've had you on the podcast before, and what's really cool is, um, you know, you've you've been in this space for a long time in Forever. terms of helping yeah. women break free from porn and other kinds of uh, unwanted sexual behaviors. So before we dive into some of the research that you guys have just put out, um, can you share just a little bit about your background and how you've gotten into this work? And also, maybe what have you seen change over since you started doing this work yeah. and where we are today? Yeah, good question. Thank you for that. I think um, looking back on all of this, I have been in this space in some form or fashion since 2007. Um, led my first recovery group in 2007. Uh, as far as a public, uh, publicly with, with this story, it's been about 2009 or so. So mm -hmm. we're talking 14 years in the public space, um, talking about women and pornography. And why would I do that? That's like insane, right? Um, so <laughs> it, 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 you know this and anybody who's heard me on your show before knows this, that it was my, it's from my own story. You know, exposed to porn at the age of 10, had an addiction through my adolescence. But um, I think what is interesting though, in those last 15, 16, 14 years, depending on how you look at it, is when I first led groups in 2007, there was like nothing on the market, nothing in the space mm -hmm. that was for women outside of the work that Marnie Furry was doing. Um, and even then that was fairly new with that she was doing that publicly. And so um, I think what I've seen the most change in, in the last, particularly the last five years or so is just more women talking about their stories publicly, whether that's through blogging or social media. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. to be talking about it more and there needs to be more than us, you know, I don't think you would say the same for you, um, you know, more than just us doing this work. And I think that that's encouraging. Yeah. Did you think, uh, was there, did you see a little bit of a ramp up maybe when like the Me Too movement came out in terms of people feeling more confident to speak into the space or what, did that not have as much of an influence as some people thought? I don't know that it was the Me Too movement. I know even within She Recovery, the biggest uh, impact actually was COVID. Mm. Um, I think part of that was just the isolation, the quarantine um, really just kind of revealed um, the need for more resources for women because they were home and they were isolated and they were struggling. And so we really saw a huge jump in our in our membership and in our our work um, in the last three years in particular. Yeah, I remember seeing some stats, uh, you know, after everything got shut down of, I think it was like May or June of two, 2020, and that there was some indicate some reports indicated a 50 to 75% spike yeah. in like porn traffic, like porn site yeah. traffic. So just, I think what you're talking well, about, yeah, there was just isolation, yeah. no, nobody going to work and it just increased so much I mean, more. Pornhub even did like sales, like they'd had like a, like three, 30 days free or whatever. So they, they, they used the fact that people were isolated and home oh, yeah. and, and not available, was not able to go to their other support groups or their, you know, whatever it is, they took advantage of that, I think in a major way. Well, one of the things I really appreciate about what you do is, uh, you know, you you not only help women who want to get out of, of pornography use and everything, but you really do a great job, I think, of educating people as well. People who don't understand kind of the female side of this mm -hmm. problem, because for so long, it was just always just sort of assumed that this is a guy problem, right? And so what I love about what you've just recently done is you have done some research that was really trying to address this question of like, 
what factors influence female porn use or what drives women to porn. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about why you wanted to do this research and then how you went about the study? Well, there's always been precious little when it comes to women and pornography use anyway, in terms of like research, time, money, resources, caring, um, you know, about women and porn use. And I was actually going to be doing a poster presentation at the American Association of Christian Counselors World Conference in September. And I really wanted to provide to that the vast number of, of counselors and clinicians more information when it came to women and porn use. I was actually at that conference eight years ago and people looked at me like I had seven heads. Um, <laughs> they had absolutely no idea that women, women, women watched porn and like they thought I was nuts or that's how I felt anyway, based on their feedback. And what was interesting, this is a little bit of a tangent, but what's interesting is that this year at that conference, I had a completely different response. In fact, it was I had dozens, if not close to a hundred different counselors come to our exhibit table saying, I actually have two or three clients right now struggling with women with this issue. So again, going back to, you know, what caused that? Is that more women watching porn or is that more women being open about the fact that they're watching porn? Personally, I hope it's just more openness, but the reality is probably more women are watching porn today. But um, I wanted to really answer the question, you know, what drives women to porn, but the stats were really about helping to kind of debunk the idea that women don't um, and really kind of look at what are the current statistics and then how do ones that we're doing actually support that or debunk that in a sense. And so in the actual, what drove the research it actually was the Pornhub stat of their 2022 annual review, where they found 36% of the worldwide viewership is female. Well, that's a lot in and of mm -hmm. itself. Um, yeah. It's something like 56% in, in like the Philippines is women, like stuff like that. Like, it's actually certain countries where it's higher than men, but based on, those stats that's those are those are based on registered user accounts and of course me as a woman me talking to women all the time we don't create we don't like to leave much of a paper trail like we are much more secretive in our behavior and so i really felt like even that 36 percent was low yeah, you know what? I, I I don't want to get ahead because in your research, I was actually amazed yeah. at the percentage of women who have never registered for an account or have never paid. So I'm with you. I think, you know, yeah. that number is probably actually higher in mm -hmm. terms of, of yeah. the porn viewing. So to answer your question, I really wanted to show to not only like Christian circles like you and I, but like the recovery community as a whole that we have to stop thinking this is just a men's issue or if it is women, it's a very small number of women. It's because of their partners. It's erotica only. But the reality is they're watching porn. They're watching Pornhub. They are engaging in, in behavior because they have a physical need, emotional need, um, not just because of a partner. And really, it's funny. I mean, it's not funny, but it's almost like I'm almost tired of of this movement of porn recovery kind of giving women an out yeah. you know because we're not doing them any favors by pretending this isn't an issue mm -hmm. you know so i kind of for me it's a passion issue because we see women every day who are struggling who need help and support but we're only a few a few women who are actually doing this work we need more people who are doing it and part of that is helping them to have the awareness that this is actually a problem and that we need to provide more resources. So how then did you go about doing the research? How did you get your subjects for the, the yeah. research itself? It's entirely virtual in terms of how we did the survey. So it was all online and it could be as anonymous as you wanted it to be. And actually we didn't ask anything about names or things like that. We asked sure, about, yeah. about ages and marital status and and stuff like that. Um, the only the only identifiable information was if they wanted 
to know the results later, they could give us their email address. So it was entirely anonymous unless they gave us their email address. And even then that's pretty anonymous. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we actually used people like you, we used Marnie, we used social media, we used lots of the people in the movement to try to just get this information, get this survey out to as many women as we could um, between July 21st and August 20th, it's basically 30 days or so, about a month of time. Um, and we ended up getting over 1300 responses by the mm-hmm. end of the day. And what were, uh, can you give us a sampling of just some of the, the key questions that you were asking? Uh, I mean, I know you can't give us all the questions, but you know, what were some of the key questions you were asking to try to understand, okay, what are the actual numbers we're talking about in terms of women that are yeah. interviewing porn or struggling this way? The actual survey was about 74 questions. Um, so it was pretty lengthy. It took people probably like 20, 25 minutes to finish it, which I'm thankful for that many completions, to be quite honest. But mm-hmm. I really wanted it to be a a, a, a a deep dive. I wanted it to be as thorough as I could in terms of the kind of information that we're, tra- we're trying to gain. Um, you know, some of the questions were going to be about, you know, what type of porn do you watch? Um, when were you exposed to porn? In what way were you exposed to porn? Um, and those types of questions, like especially those early exposure questions, they matter because it does influence, you know, where you are 10 year, 10, 20 years later. Um, like for me, for example, I was exposed to hardcore pornography at the age of 10. Had I been exposed to a romance novel at the age of 10, it's possible that my behaviors may not have escalated as as strongly as they did but my first exposure my first sex education was hardcore pornography Mm -hmm. that influences how i perceive interact with sex later in life same thing happens with men but um so we ask questions about that we ask questions about you know how why where and what in terms of that early exposure and then uh, when did it become more habitual for you? When did when did it become less about curiosity or more about like I need to use this? Mm-hmm. So we asked questions about those things. We asked about why, um, you know, when do you, when do you most frequently want to use porn? Um, you know, those types of questions. We also asked questions about other disordered behaviors, so shopping, food. Um, social media, things like that, to see if there's any co-occurring issues mm-hmm. going on, um, and things like that. So a lot of just different different things that we ended up addressing. So what were some of the the key findings then that you discovered out of this research? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about this before with the whole, you know, registered user account thing, right? Um, and this is obviously something that has it's it's been a hypothesis in my mind for a, quite a while that there obviously are more women watching porn than maybe we even think there are. And actually, in many ways, the survey actually made me think that number is even higher than even I probably thought um, based on just this one stat alone. But going back to you know Pornhub statistics are based on registered user accounts. Well, only. of our surveyors ever created an account. Mm. So we're talking 86.6% of those who took the survey had never created an account on a porn site, let alone Pornhub, but any, any porn site. Yeah. Um, And then 82.1% had never paid for porn in any form. So again, this goes back to women not wanting to kind of, have a paper trail. They, they covered their tracks, I think, a little bit better than men do um, in terms of their porn use. But that to me was like even higher than I would have thought in terms of the lack of registered accounts um, that even fewer women I, than I even thought created an account. Um, and then, of course, the, there's, there's the assumption that women are visual or non-visual we only use porn because of a partner. We just mm-hmm. read novels. You know, we're not watching hardcore porn. Women hate porn, right? Um, and so we asked, you know, most frequently, what do you use porn for? Um, and, fi- and more than 50% said was for physical relief. So masturbation for sex, you know, and then for um, about 40, 
I think it's 46% said it was for emotional relief. So maybe um, tiredness, stress, boredom, things like that. Only 2.2% used it because of a partner. Um, so I think that, or as primary as for a partner. And so I think it's just, it's interesting that the things that we've seen for 15 years, we can actually prove now through this survey. Yeah. Um, now I know I, I want to ask a question about that because I know sometimes, you know, it's, you can get this data, right? And then sometimes uh, 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 interpreting it can be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So, but, but I'm going to ask you this question because I know that you have personally been in this space of ministry for a long time. And so you've got, a, I think you can take some of the data with the question I'm about to ask and combine it with your experience in ministry and a lot of anecdotal evidence that you can have to maybe try to interpret this. But when I look at that stat that says over 50% of the women surveyed are going to pornography for physical relief. What are some of the, um, what does that mean? I mean, I know what it means in terms of like masturbation or some kind of relief, but, but what do you think is some of the cause of that um, based on your experience in this place of ministry? Because I think that's a huge, I think there's going to be some cognitive dissonance for a lot of our listeners that go, that doesn't fit the paradigm of how I have often thought of, even if I didn't, uh, was willing to say, oh yeah, I, I think that women look at pornography. That reasoning would not necessarily compute in their minds. Yeah. It helps us to understand that yeah. a little bit more. Research plus what we've seen or what we hear about regularly um, within our, our four walls of, of ministry um, is women have sexual urges. I mean, I'll just keep it at that. I mean, women are sexual beings. We have sexual mm -hmm. desire. We have sexual urges. And I also think that if you're looking at it in terms of, you can look at the marital status um, on that survey as well, and close to 50% were single. Okay. And so you're talking about single women who have sexual desire, who have sexual urges, and pornography is extremely safe when it comes to getting a sexual need, getting a sexual desire fulfilled, more so than trying to find a hookup on a dating app, than trying to, you know, have premarital sex. Um, these aren't all Christian women, but sometimes that that matters in terms of that. There's no risk for pregnancy. You know, so there's, there's a lot of things here that porn is enticing because it doesn't have negative consequences, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, in right. terms of anything else. They don't understand that there are negative consequences to porn use. And obviously, once they're in addiction and they're having issues, maybe even connecting emotionally with people, you start to see the negative impact of pornography. But I do think that just in general, um, that 51% or so who are using porn primarily for physical release, they have sexual desire. Um, mm -hmm. And possibly that sexual desire is out of balance because of porn use. And so there's a, there's an extra charge there in terms of like, I need this because I'm sexually charged, but it really is addiction that's driving that desire possibly. Um, but I don't, I think it might surprise people to know that women are, are sexual and they mm -hmm. like sex and orgasms are fun and exciting and pleasurable. Um, and that pornography does is a great catalyst for those sexual releases. And I think that's where a lot of it, it's effective. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where a lot of the imbalance has been too, just historically, right? Where this yeah. is a men are like these uh, uh, sexual aggressors or the men, men are the ones that have higher urges or higher, you know, whatever. And then there's, you know, there's been the subordination basically of women yeah. or the women are the objects of those desires. So it's all, it's almost like there's this subconscious assumption. Men are the ones that have like needs that push them toward sexual activity. Mm -hmm. Whereas women are just supposed to be these, I hate to put it this way, but like receptacles or something. And it's like, and yeah. this, it's, it's, it's awful. It's part of, I think the, it's not only a, a, uh, a wrong way to see it. I think also what it can do is it can, it can even perpetuate that oppressive dynamic 
between men and women. And it perpetuates the shame of women who are sexual, right. who are watching porn, who are using porn, because it makes, because the patriarchal or whatever society says women shouldn't be sexual or they aren't sexual. And so when you have a woman who is, which all of us are, we're all sexual, but when you have a woman who believes based on what she's seeing culturally, she's not supposed to be. And so there's something wrong with her. She's more masculine. She's like a man. And so why would she tell someone? Why would she seek support or help if she feels like she's the only one? Other, she feels like something's mm-hmm. wrong with her or whatever. And so it, it does compound, I think, the shame even even greater. You know, there were a few other things that I saw just kind of in the additional findings that were part of your research study that a couple of them just absolutely broke my heart because I, I thought, you know, one of them was the fact that 48% of your respondents under childhood experiences were victims of sexual abuse. So that nearly 50% of all of your respondents. So how much do you see a correlation there sometimes too, between sexual abuse and then porn use among women? Oh, hey, you're, you're muted. Sorry, I was coughing. Um, no problem. So, yeah. <laughs> but I think um, those numbers do jive with what we see regularly within our, our organization, um, unfortunately. And sexual abuse, um, that number, uh, just, just for reference, that number includes um, adult sexual abuse, but also child-on-child sexual abuse. And so mm-hmm. we're talking about um, peers maybe touching inappropriately, um, to them, um, or, or it was an adult who touched them inappropriately. Um, so it's both, but we do see that rise. We have seen a rise in that child on child sexual abuse quite a bit, um, with the younger generation. So particularly like the porn generation really is the ones who grew up with technology. So maybe, um, young, young millennials or early Gen Z, um, who are, um, who grew up with porn, who grew up, um, with easy access to porn. We all grew up with porn in some way, but easy access to porn, um, are experiencing more of that, um, the child on child where peers are acting out porn with each other, um, which, which is still sexual abuse, um, and still does not impact them, um, into adulthood. Um, but we do see sexual abuse, um, in, in both ways, um, within our, within our organization for sure. Yeah. Well, you know, another one that really broke my heart was just the, the, uh, I guess the average age of porn exposure mm-hmm. and the fact that you had over 58% that their first time exposure was tw- uh, younger, 12 or younger. Yeah. And sometimes as young as seven years, you know, seven years old. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that and just how powerful an influence that is in terms of sort of hooking a young heart. I mean, that was my story. I was 10 years old. I was in that bracket. Um, and so it did, it, it, it does impact you in a, in a very significant way because for most of those children who are you know, most of the, not they're adults, but most of those people who were children at the age of exposure, um, they likely never had a sex conversation. They never had a birds and the bees talk, you know, with a parent, um, at that, at Bible, before they saw porn. And so their first real experience with sex has is pornography, which in from my experience was hardcore, like messy porn, you know, and it was like not even as you would picture healthy intimacy or sexuality to be, right? But I think that that's 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 the case for these people as well, because porn is such a is not an excellent representation of what sex, especially biblical sexuality, is supposed to look like. Um, and so it does have a really deep like effect because you're talking about true formative years yeah. where your brain isn't developed yet. You're just a soft cupcake, like you're underbaked, you know? Um, and so you're not at the point where you can even cognitively understand what you're seeing. And yet you understand that this is supposed to be sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that becomes your barometer or your measure for what sex is supposed to look like, what you're supposed to look like, um, what you're supposed to experience, what you're supposed to do. 
which again goes back to a little bit of the patriarchal like girls are supposed to be used because that's what's what porn you know shows is that women are primarily the ones who are being used uh, more than more than the boys are and so i think for girls in particular it's like we are shown this this false reality of what we're supposed to act like look like be like and so we're for some reason we're shocked when we are told that we're not supposed to be sexual we, so it's it's that 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 tension you know yeah which is why i think you know, you've mentioned it. I know uh, Jessica Harris and others have mentioned it about why that just almost makes a, a woman feel like or a girl feel like she's got to go even more underground, like because yeah. of just the the disconnect there, the shame. It's like, what if I just have a normal sexual feeling? Oh, my goodness, something's wrong with that. Right. Mm-hmm. And so and then, like you said, you add porn to that. It's compounded. Yeah. And in particularly, you know, I think most of your viewers are probably Christian, but in even with especially within the church we don't talk about sex in terms of female pleasure almost at all right it's it's all about husband satisfy or what wives satisfy your husbands they skip over the fact that paul also says men you're responsible for the sexual needs of your wives but we skip over that part um quite a bit and so again you're talking about it in terms of like what we've been taught by the mainstream so mainstream pornography versus what we're taught in the church is that mainstream porn tells me that I should be sexual and enjoy it because that's what it looks like in porn. But in the church is it's only for my husband. Mm-hmm. And so it's that disconnect of like, but, but I do, I do enjoy sex. I do enjoy sex. I have, I have sexual urges. I have sexual thoughts, but if I have sexual thoughts as a Christian woman, I'm sinful. Yeah. Even though it's not sinful to have sexual thoughts, it's it's sinful to act the act out those sexual thoughts outside of the context of biblical marriage. Yeah. A couple other of your findings that I found interesting, and this is where I want to kind of transition then to how you're wanting to use this research and 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 uh, where people can get help is the fact that the overwhelming majority of your respondents had never attended a support group or never sought counseling for porn years. Yeah. Like you had over 93% that had never been to a group and over 72% that had never sought out counseling. Talk a little bit about that and how we can maybe change that percentage. That makes me so sad. That's our whole yeah. purpose of recovery right. is providing space for, for groups and to provide an opportunity for counseling. Um, and so we're seeing that they're either they don't know about it or they're not utilizing it. And of course, that's very sad to me personally. I think that personally offensive. Um, but I think, again, I don't know why other than, again, just the debilitating shame. And if you don't know that there are options for you, if you don't know that there's a space for you to go, you're probably not going to ask anybody for help because you're going to try to find that help on your own some way. And so I think the way that we fix that or help that hopefully is by me doing four podcasts in a week like this um, and talking to other people and trying to get the message out that there are spaces that have been created that are safe for women to find and receive healing. Um, not just sobriety, not just stop acting out behaviors, but really get to that long lasting, meaningful recovery and healing so that you don't have to go back to any of these behaviors again, um, which I believe is possible. And so it does take a community of people, people in this movement, which goes back to why do I do this research is to show clinicians, to show people in this in this space that women are not seeking support, I think because they don't realize that there's options for them and that they don't realize that it's not just them, that there are millions of women in this world who are watching porn and maybe who don't mind that they're watching porn, but there's millions of women who are watching porn in this world. They are not alone. And if they want to stop and they, they want to get well, there are options for that. And there is a way to do that. Yeah. 
So speaking of that, um, where can uh, our listeners go to, first of all, get more information about this research that you've done, but also just the resources that you offer through your ministry? Yeah, our preliminary results from our research, it's a two-page download. You can get that on our website at sherecovery.com. It's right there on the homepage right now. We have it available to download. And we hope you do. It is interesting study. It's interesting reading to figure, to see like this, the numbers are kind of astounding. But so I encourage you guys to check that out. And then while you're there at SheRecovery.com, you can also learn more about um, the different options that we have available from our Facebook community to our meetings, to our counseling services. Um, It's all there for you to, to review and to dive into. Yeah. Well, Crystal, it's always good to connect with you. And I love the work that you've been doing for a long time. Just I want to encourage you to uh, to to continue to um, persevere in this space. I know to do this kind of work for a long time can be um, exhausting. Uh, and But I, I really appreciate you being in this space. And I really appreciate you doing this work um, with this research and making it available so that people can kind of have their eyes open and go, oh, I didn't realize that, and then do something about it. So thank yeah. you for being with us today. Well, thank you for providing the space to share about it and, and for what you do as well. Yeah. Well, listeners and viewers, we are going to put uh, the SheRecovery.com web link in our notes today for this podcast. Please go see what Crystal has been doing for a long time and doing really well to help women break free from porn. Um, And we are always glad that you've been with us and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. (laughs) 